Feminists despise porn, sex, and fun in general with an utterly religious zeal. Why haven't we declared feminism a religion yet? It surely fits the description much better than Buddhism, for instance. <laughs> no offense for Buddhists. But feminism, joke aside, is even more sinister than that. Let's explore. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. I'm always somewhat surprised at the fact that quite a significant chunk of people are completely unaware of the fact that the largest opposition to pornography these days does not come from so-called traditionalists, or from the conservatives, or from fundamentalist Islam. In fact, some Islamic scholars argue that only hardcore pornography is haram, and they do so in an attempt to reconcile with reality and the reality being that six of the top ten nations who seek most of the porn on the internet are, well, Islamic nations. The harshest opposition comes from the totalitarian, progressive, influential, illiberal feminists. That's where the opposition to free sexual expression in artistic movies really does come from. And this is not something new. There are quite literally mountains of writings advocating for bans on pornography written by mainstream and respectable feminists, which tells you how much of the respect feminism still enjoys is based on deceit and lies. In Iceland, prominent feminists were up in arms to quite literally cut off the nation from the global internet. Well, they didn't actually require that, but their ban on online porn pretty much means pulling a People's Republic of China shtick in order to make it work in a decent manner. Now, that plan failed, yet pornography in general is still technically banned in Iceland. Iceland is also the only country outside of the group of Islamic theocracies where strip clubs are banned. And they are banned under feminist rationales, mind you. Isn't it lovely? But okay, Iceland is a tiny nation at the edge of Europe with a population almost the size of the neighborhood I live in. So it's not really representative, right? Well, actually it is. Iceland and Sweden in some other respects, such as their prostitution laws, these two countries represent a peek into the future that awaits all of us if the feminist insanity is not put in its place. And that is the dustbin of history right next to communism, fascism, and the rest of the totalitarian garbage. But what happens when feminist bullying meets overzealous university religious administrations and the Guardian columnists? Well, you get Orwellian feminism on steroids. That's what you get. The Guardian columnist Brigitte Delaney explains to us simpletons with a straight face that censorship is freedom and that a ban a la Islamic Republic of Iran is absolutely fabulous. Let's, let's read a bit from this idiocy. Quote, Male students can argue that banning access to porn is a limit to their free expression, but I'd prefer to fight for the, women, for the freedom of women to feel safe. And it goes on. The piece is really long, but a lot of it is golden. Quote, you're young, as hot as you're probably ever going to get, and there's a party on every night with people as young and as bright and as hot as you. And you want to stay in your room and masturbate to internet porn? Really? Well, yes, really. What is your business with what legal adults do with their time? Anyway. This week, Melbourne University's Ormond College blocked access to porn websites on its Wi-Fi network, stating that the genre does not allow people at a formative stage of life to develop a healthy sexuality. Some students have argued that not all pornography is demeaning, it's even educational, and to deny students the ability to watch porn in their rooms is to clamp down on freedom of expression. But I reckon there are other freedoms that are more worth fighting for. And here comes the totalitarian way of viewing freedom. Quote, In its own way, college life can be a utopia distinct from the real world, a time and space apart. This can be incredible, willing away the days spent on the lawns reading a book or putting on a play that fails, singing in a choir or joining the Fabians, staying up late at night drinking port and talking about post-structuralism if that floats your boat. But a utopia can go both ways. 
freedom from something or freedom to do something. You can be free to spend the whole semester reading Ulysses in the sunny parts of the quadrangle, to walk around in your academic gown over your pyjamas, to drink all night and not face too many consequences in the morning. But we should also be able to argue for freedom from posters around the college that objectify women, pimps and prostitute themed balls, for example, and pro-rape Facebook pages set up by college students. And here comes the special snowflake mentality. Now, I really don't know if this argument is wrong for its misandry or for its misogyny. I mean, feminists genuinely believe that women are so fragile that they can't live in a free society where a pimp-themed ball exists. And it gets even worse. The reasons behind the porn ban are sound. In order to create a space where young women can thrive, you attempt to remove the conditions where they may be degraded. And if young women thrive, young men thrive as well. Well, no, they don't. Not if you engineer your little utopia where everything is centered around women and purposefully at the expense of men. This mentality that if women are pampered from reality all the time, every time, then all will be well for everyone, including men, is completely nonsensical. At best, it will create very weak, insufferable women who are completely useless in the work environment whilst it won't impact men almost at all, or at worst, it will make everyone worse off. Sheesh. And then she ends her appeal for totalitarianism in this fashion, quote, After all, you have the rest of your life to watch porn on the internet. You'll eventually, hopefully, move into a flat and live on your own. You may come home at night from your job at the investment bank and have long, long, lonely hours to fill and high-speed broadband to help you fill it. But now, log off. There are parties to be had, connections to be made, and people, real-life people, to meet who will blow your mind and change your life more than any porn site. Again, what business does she have with what legal adults do with their own time? Also, notice that I say people or adults because, contrary to feminist assumptions, both sexes enjoy porn. Also, it's ironic that feminists always assume that women earn less because of discrimination, yet in the porn industry it's women who earn far more than men, which is one of the reasons why many porn stars are adamant anti-feminists. To put it in plain English, feminists want to destroy an industry that pays women huge amounts of cash for very easy and generally, let's face it, enjoyable work. <clears throat> but the more you look close to feminism, the more the word feminazi seems quite an understatement in comparison to what, to what actual mainstream influential feminists really believe. And no matter how many no-true Scotsman fallacies you feminists out there bring, it still doesn't change the undeniable fact that most of the influential feminists out there are really completely wrong in the head. Not only feminists hate porn, normal sex, although they do hate non-normative sex sexual activity as well, since the most creative reasons to hate homosexual men usually come from feminists. <laughs> but anyway, so as I was saying, not only feminists hate porn, sex, and having fun in general, but they hate human nature itself, and they hate men. Let me give you a few mainstream examples for both of these accusations. First, let's start with the human nature. Listen to this. Over the last decade and more, feminists have been analyzing how normative heterosexuality affects the lives of heterosexuals. In so doing, they have drawn on earlier feminists such as Charlotte Bunch, Adrienne Rich, and Monique Whitting, who related heterosexuality to the perpetuation of gender divisions of labor and male appropriation of women's productive and reproductive capacities. Indeed, Rich's concept of compulsory heterosexuality could be seen as a forerunner of heteronormativity, and I would like to preserve an often neglected legacy of the former concept that institutionalized normative heterosexuality regulates those kept within its boundaries, as well as marginalizing and sanctioning those outside them. The term heteronormativity has not always captured this double-sided social regulation. Feminists have a vested interest in what goes on within, sexual, within heterosexual relations because we are concerned with the ways in which heterosexuality depends upon and guarantees gender division. The analysis of heteronormativity needs to be rethought in terms of what is subject to regulation on both sides of the normatively prescribed boundaries of heterosexuality, both sexuality and 
gender. This is not some fringe Radfem blog, but it's mainstream academic feminism. Governments take your tax money to fund this idiocy. This is a 2006 article in the journal Feminist Theory by University of York, Professor Stevie Jackson. Also, the belief that heterosexuality itself needs to be abolished is as mainstream as it can get in feminist circle. Here's another gem. Men are routinely accessing male power over women whether or not they intend to exercise such power. But they are also constrained by the construction of adult heterosexuality as masculinity. We argue that sexually young people are all in the same boat in that heterosexuality is masculinity, only thinly disguised, but that resistance is possible and heterosexuality could be otherwise. Resisting heterosexuality is not only a question of how young people choose their sexual partners, resistance includes a critical exploration and disruption of desire, embodiment and gender. Although very few of the young people in our studies identified themselves as lesbian, gay or bisexual, such identities, while not freeing them from the gender relations of heterosexuality, can afford them a degree of freedom in the invention and negotiation of their sexual relationships. Some young people are clearly resisting the pressures of heterosexuality and searching for other ways of being sexual. While young people's resistance to heterosexuality can be socially constructed in varying ways, the potential for young people to have a subversive or transformative effect on sexual relationships appears to be limited. Analysis of the strategies of resistance become important in our understanding of the location of male power in heterosexuality. So, heterosexuality is just a social construct enforced by patriarchal force. And this is not Tumblr. What I just read comes from the book called The Male in the Head, Young People, Heterosexuality and Power, published in 1998 and authored by three esteemed messed up ideologues, <coughs> sorry, I mean British academics, Janet Holland, Caroline Rapazanoglu, uh, Sue Sharpie and Rachel Thompson. These authors are not fringe by any means. Holland and Ramazanoglu offered a textbook feminist methodology manual paid by the taxpayers, whilst Thompson is the director of the University of Sussex Center for Innovation and Research in Childhood and Youth. If you're British, you pay for these fucktard salaries. Most of the claims that you just heard are based on research that was funded by the British taxpayers under the pretext of AIDS prevention. Let that sink in. More to the point, <clears throat> most of these people produce this kind of research that eventually ends up influencing policies such as school curricula or even a criminal policy. And they're quite open about the fact that they wish to have a subversive or transformative effect. Now, okay, but what I've shown so far only makes them subversive sneaky commies at worst or just Orwellian bigots. Surely it doesn't make them Nazis, right? I mean, it's not like mainstream feminists advocated anything Nazi-like, it's just little bigots on their blogs using anonymity to spout bullshit, right? Well, wrong. <clears throat> Meet Julie Bindel, a top-notch mainstream feminist columnist at The Guardian and the founder of Justice for Women, a charity that literally defends women who kill men. In one of the cases proudly presented on her charity website, is one that got the law changed to make it easier for women to get away with murder. I'm not joking, you can look at this for yourself. This murderous bitch, initially sentenced to life imprisonment by a jury, a proper sentence for murder if you ask me, was then released in appeal because Bindel's charity brought in feminist experts who convinced a judge, not a jury mind you, behind closed doors that she was in fact the victim because we all know that all women are victims, even when they kill other people. So what does Julie Bindel thinks about men? Well, when asked if heterosexuality will survive women's liberation, Miss Bindel answered as follows, quote, It won't. Not unless men get their act together, have their power taken from them, and behave themselves. 
I mean, I would actually put them all in some kind of cab where they can all drive around in quad bikes or bicycles or white vans. I would give them a choice of vehicles to drive around with, give them no porn, they wouldn't be able to fight, we would have wardens, of course. Women who want to see their sons or male loved ones would uh, be able to go and visit or take them out like a library book and then bring them back. I hope heterosexuality doesn't survive, actually. I would like to see a truce on heterosexuality. I would like an amnesty on heterosexuality until we have sorted ourselves out. Because under patriarchy, it's shit. And I am sick of uh, hearing from individual women that their men are all right. Those men have been shored up by the advantages of patriarchy and they are complacent. And they are not stopping other men from being shit. I would love to see a women's liberation that results in women turning away from men and saying, when you come back as human beings, then we might look again. Are we clear? Men are not human beings. This woman changed laws in your country my dear British followers. I'll say this again. This vile piece of human garbage changed laws in a civilized nation. This kind of discourse doesn't come from Tumblr or other degenerates that write shit online. No, no, no. Those are the useful idiots that follow as a consequence from the garbage promoted in the academe, in the culture, and in the law by pieces of human vermin like the Julie Bindels of the world, like the Janet Hollands of the world, like the Caroline Ramazanoglu's of the world, and the rest of the similarly deranged nutjobs that pollute the European and North American academe and culture. If you're a feminist watching this, consider this. The actual leaders of your movement would want to take your son, your father, your husband, or your uncle, put him in a concentration camp, and allow you limited access like to a lab library book, and then force you to take them back. The actual leaders of your movement believe your son is not human. And they're not even hiding that aspect. They're as honest as they can get. And the fact that you are a feminist makes you complicit. There, I said it. Not speaking against this lunacy or defending feminism as if this lunacy is not real feminism makes you, as an individual feminist, directly complicit and morally responsible for this garbage. And quite frankly, makes you morally reprehensible as a human being. Knowing about these facts and still calling yourself a feminist says more about you than the Julie Bindels of the world. At least we already know about the Julie Bindels of the world that they are insane. There will come a time, not too long from now, when individual feminists will have to start being held morally responsible for all the ills that their ideology has produced. And I can hardly wait for that day to come. That's all I have to say. Thanks for watching.